Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brenneman Blueprint. So earlier this year, I joined the Cashflow Connections podcast with Hunter Thompson and Tyler Lyons. Tyler Lyons interviewed me, and this week's Brenneman Blueprint episode is going to be me as the interviewee with Tyler. So on this episode, you're going to hear a lot about the 2024 market uh, from yours truly. And then also we get into our proprietary location scoring system where we score and rank every zip code in the country, plus a lot on other technology that we've developed and employ today. And then also I go back and talk about the two deals that we close at the end of 2023, how those deals came together, what the numbers look like. So hope you all enjoy. Look, we all know that real estate has created more millionaires than pretty much any other business. The problem is it's also created a lot of heartaches and bankruptcies. Sure, we can get access to a ton of real estate education on the internet, but that's precisely the problem. How can we tell which strategies will consistently produce asymmetric returns and which should be avoided at all costs? My goal is to give real estate entrepreneurs, capital raisers, and investors all of the secrets so that we can grow our portfolios without dealing with costly investment nightmares. And that's what this program is all about. I'm Hunter Thompson, and welcome to the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Lyons, and I'm very excited for the guests that we have here today. He's the founder of Brenneman Capital, and he has dedicated his career to building an organization that makes investing in high-quality real estate opportunities available to Paso investors. He's also a repeat guest on the show as well, so if you'd like to hear his full story, make sure you check out episode 592. And even though he's still relatively young, you know, he's been in the game for a long time, and uh, as I've gotten to know him, I've really come to value his insights when it comes to the world of real estate and multifamily. So Drew Brenneman, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate uh, being here again. I was on talking to someone else. It was funny where I just, it dawned on me like a month ago that I've actually been doing real estate for half my life now. So I'm uh, I'm 38 and I started when I was 19. So it feels like yesterday. That's awesome, man. Because we have a lot of people on the show too, who a lot of folks on the show don't actually start in real estate. They kind of find their way into it like I did. But you, yeah, you kind of almost pretty much rolled out of the womb doing real estate, which is uh, pretty interesting and pretty impressive. And you've got a lot of experience to draw on given how long you've been in the game. So I'll let listeners go back to episode 592 if they want to hear your full story, but maybe give us the quick cliff notes, you know, kind of the quick overview of uh, you've been in the game for a while. You know, how'd you kind of get into it and, and how'd you end up where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I started back in 2005 uh, just to purchase my first rental property with my own money. I bought a duplex in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm from the Milwaukee area and then went to college at UW Madison. And so, yeah, I was fortunate like to yeah roll out of uh, out of high school and then straight into the, the fast paced world of real estate. But, you know, where I made some money as a high schooler with an Internet business, reselling items in an online video game, Diablo 2, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, those games. And I, I saved all the money. And then what ended up happening was I started doing probably the stuff, you know, regular people do when they're like my age. Now I was already reading rich dad, poor dad and thinking grow rich and intelligent investor and those kind of books, looking at what to do with this money. Cause I really didn't want to squander it. I think that kind of came from my parents being like very careful with your money. And so I think they, you know, that was sort of instilled in me and they invested, but they were both teachers. So it wasn't like they were in the investment world. Yeah. And so I bought four properties while I was in college at Madison, then graduated, moved up to Minnesota for my first job. And then while I was there, I met my first investor. It was a coworker and his dad. And yeah, fast forward to today, me and then the the two of them, and then it's expanded into a lot of other investors. But now we have a 235 million of property, 27 deals now. I think I bought about 40 different properties uh, throughout the years mostly done multifamily early on it was actually more commercial after the duplexes and i went from the two and three units to buying shopping centers just to find my way back to to multifamily we've gone full cycle on 10 deals like the 22 percent average irr we're typically like a longer holder though a lot of the deals i bought back in 2009 10 11 we still haven't sold and we got no no plans on doing it i know i was talking to you last year about the deals we were um we were closing and uh i mean those were we proposed a 10-year hold to everyone when we showed the deal to our investors and knowing who's in those like a lot of those people they'll they're not going to want to sell really ever you know like as long as they can get a return of capital you know so let's say you do a cash out refi in year five and maybe another one in year 10 like the makeup of that group there's going to be you're going to hold those for a long time so 
I think that's one thing that makes us different is we've been long-term holders. I've just seen a lot of people, especially in Chicago. So after moving to living in Minnesota, I moved to Chicago and then bought the bulk of my deals there. And then now I've moved to Texas, but we're still buying primarily in the Midwest. And I saw a lot of families just make a lot of money with the most simple plan ever. Like I bought a deal from someone whose dad bought 40 some duplexes in the Lincoln Park neighborhood in the 70s. And at that time, those would have been like $10,000 properties. And now today they're all a million each. Right. So, I mean, just buying and holding, if they would have done nothing else with cash flow, I mean, they probably made $80 million on that. Yeah. It's pretty simple. So we're trying to do a a kind of a similar version to that. Obviously we do sell deals, but not, you know, not, we're not really like the three year, two year hold, like flipper type. So yeah, good stuff, man. I'm definitely sympathetic to longer term hold sort of strategies with my personal portfolio. That's kind of what I've done. I've had these properties for almost a decade now and just seeing the impact that time has. If you just buy quality real estate, let time do its thing and just wait, it can really uh, generate nice returns over the long term. So it's great that you've got a good investor base who's sympathetic to that as well, because you always want to match the investment opportunity to whatever your investors want. So the fact that you've got some folks who are patient like that and are into capital preservation and thinking long term, that's really good. And as we kind of started preparing for the conversation here today, Drew, one thing that you and I uh, kind of traded some ideas on was the, the the use of technology and kind of how you use tech in, in your business, how you use tech to gain a competitive advantage. In our last interview, we touched very briefly on, I know you talked about, you know, how you and your team use data to analyze markets and some tools you've developed from that perspective. So when it comes to using technology to gain a competitive advantage in this very competitive industry, how are you going out there and doing that right now? Yeah. And we, a couple of our larger investors, they're all former traders. This is, you know, a Chicago thing where they're trading in the pits, yelling back in the day, and they all want to know what's your edge on this investment. So, you know, if you tell them like, we're buying a deal, there was 50 offers, we're paying the most, you know, but we have a good plan. Like, you know, that's not a very good pitch. So we, we thought a lot about what advantages we can develop and yeah, one of them, I guess, is how I mentioned how we buy properties, but really, you know, another big one is tech, like you're talking about. So, yeah, we have a lot of tools, you know, first starting with like our underwriting model. So, you know, initially or really for the first 10 years so until or 15, until 2019, I underwrote every deal. I feel like I had a pretty good model, but the one we use now like is a million light years better. So one of the guys that I hired, he used to work at a $50 billion private equity company. And during the pandemic, he redid their model. And then that's what they started using company wide. And eventually I was able to hire him. And then we took that model and improved on it quite a bit from there for our, our use. So like we, we take the, like, let's say we're underwriting a deal in terms of the technology. What do we use? The first thing we have is a subscription to red IQ. And what that is, is that's a, an AI tool where it scans, let's say you get financials on a deal. So you get a T12 and a rent roll, but maybe they're sent to you in a PDF. So traditionally you would have to manually type everything in your model, take forever. And then what this does is you upload the PDF to Red IQ and then in Red IQ, you categorize it to the categories you use. So let's say some people trash might be a utility. Some folks, it's a, a contract service. Some people it's in repairs, depends. There's no right way to do it, but this is so that Red IQ knows where we put it, where we, we put it as a utility, if anyone wants to know. But do they? So it sees trash. It already knows we change it to utilities. So it saves a teeny amount of time on categorizing. But the main thing is, if you get sent to PDF, it saves a ton of time because the export out of Red IQ is in Excel. So then we take what's in Excel, we copy and paste it into our model. And then the way our model set up now, it has all these different lookup functions where it takes what was dumped in and it flows through the whole model. Mm. So your model, if your assumptions were just, we're going to run it exactly like the prior owner, you're pretty much done. It just already has your growth rates in there. But obviously we don't just assume like it's going to be like the owner's T12. You know, usually those are lighter expenses and you're going to have a different business plan probably than them. And then that's when we start making we start entering our assumptions. We get, you enter in what the rents are by unit type. And on the rent analysis tab, it has each type of unit is color. It has every lease signed leading up to that date within the last 12 months. And they're color coded based on what direction they're moving. So 
you know, back in the old days when, you know, Phoenix was ripping just up hyperbolic, you'd underwrite a deal and every unit code was bright, red, uh, bright green for going up. Very strong market when we dump those deals into our model uh, at the time. And then a lot of other markets that people claimed were hot. It was all over the board. It was like, oh, this one's up, this one's down. And then from there, you enter in your assumptions, probably similar to a lot of other models. What are your, what's your renovation plan going to be? What are your future growth assumptions? What are your operating expenses going to be? And then of course, has like a normal waterfall and everything in there. So that's, I guess that's number one. You want me to just keep ripping through or what? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. really helpful. I definitely want to get your perspective on how you analyze markets too, because I know we okay briefly on that in the last episode, you know, cause you've developed some processes and some technology to really allow you and your team to analyze at a zip code level, if I'm not mistaken, like yeah. where you think the strongest areas are. And even if you choose a market, like let's say you choose Phoenix, you choose Dallas, whatever your market might be you know, having analysis based on zip code can be really helpful to help you understand like, okay, where are the sub markets where I want to focus? I'll turn the mic back over to you and let you kind of explain a little some of the tools you've developed from that standpoint. Yeah, we made two tools and one of them is really MSA level, sort of think of it like how if you were to go on Yardi or CoStar and they would maybe rank the markets or you get a Marcus and Millichap annual apartment report and they have the markets ranked, you know, one to 50, whatever. And so we set out to make our own tool where initially we tried using AI and then that it was, we made it, but it was, it was kind of like a black box. It was, you'd make it and then it would spit out a result, but you weren't, you were relying on the algorithm to tell you what to do essentially. So then it was hard to feel completely comfortable with what's the result. It would be like, if you went to chat GPT, basically and go like, what's the best five markets for apartments? You know, it's like, I don't understand the methodology they're gonna use. I'm not that comfortable with that, but we made a model that is what we did was we went back and we found out what was correlated with price appreciation, all these different variables. So let's say, you know, we look at, we have all the property sale data points. So we, we first, we tracked what was the appreciation in every market since the year 2000. So we have that. And then we started pulling economic demographic apartment, fundamental data, new supply, rent growth, occupancy, affordability, single family home price appreciation, and then also pulling up the rate of change stats from those. So calculating what's the rate of change in new supply, what's the rate of change in rent growth, rate of change in median household income, like all these different data points, and then finding out what was going on in those years where prices went up, where they went down, when they were flat, and figuring out what was correlated with the prices going up, and then matching it up. So back testing it, but it was maybe different than back testing because we're literally making it off of the past 20 years at the time. And then going, okay, this is what's correlated with this, with prices going up the most. So we're going to put more weight on that, less weight on other things. And then we can use that. We we use that like today to see what are the strongest markets because we have all the data where we're pulling this data from CoStar and from Zillow where and from Fred, that economic website where the, basically you can find ever, anything on a MSA on those websites you'd want that would be relevant. And so then we know how strong is the market today and then using today's data and then what happened the last 20 years to know what moves the model, we can then predict out the next one in two years. So it's interesting where, you know, in uh, in the model at the time when we made it, the Sun Belt, all those markets were at the top. And as we updated it, they all started dropping to the bottom. And the Midwest markets were at the top now, except for Miami. That's actually still the top market in our model. And so it's like basically Miami, and then it's all these Midwest cities, Madison, Grand Rapids, Chicago, Milwaukee, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, like those are the top markets now. And because if you if you know what's going on property level, you you see that where, okay, you're getting to get all these pretty low property level scores because now rents are declining in the Sun Belt, occupancies are declining. Whereas in the Midwest, those are positive. So then it's going to show like this is stronger. And the output it kicks out is a the baseline number you have to have in your head is the annual appreciation for the country. And then what it kicks out is a number of what is it relative to the annual. So let's say the top market in our model right now, it is probably like a, it's like a 1.4 score, meaning we have Miami getting 1.4 times the national average of appreciation. Mm -hmm. Whereas like on the bottom end, like, uh, 
some of the lowest markets are these ones that are oversupplied, like Austin, like Nashville. And those might be like a 0.6, you know, where those are way below the national average. And so that seemed the most accurate output to kick out because we're not predicting what the country is going to do, let's say, but we're predicting relative to the, because that's what we're able to be very precise about. And when we did it, it was, it was made through running linear regressions on these past years. And the, the margin of error we were getting, I believe it's called a Z score. It was really low. So we, that's why we chose that. It would be great if we could just say like, yeah, we know we're predicting Miami is going to go up 9% next year, but it's, it would be less accurate if we did it that way. And what we're trying to do is basically just position ourselves over the long term in the best markets. The thing is, we're not buying in Miami because we're not, you know, I'm from the Midwest. So, you know, I'm already buying in Chicago. So let's say if that comes up as a top market, well, great, keep buying there. If it dropped to the bottom, then let's let's take a pause. But where we're not just hopping in and out of markets because it's really, you know, obviously you need to build up expertise and, uh, you know, real estate's very local for the actual properties and for the relationship. So you, we're not at the size where we could just be like, okay, great, we're in Miami now and then we're in the next hot market. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, super interesting. So, and my follow-up question was going to be, you know, how has your thesis maybe changed since you started analyzing this data? And it's really interesting to hear that, yeah, some of the Midwest markets are kind of jumping up a little bit higher, which, you know, if you look across the data that you see from a rent growth perspective, so on and so forth, vacancy perspective, that that does make sense to me. I guess when you think longer term, because I, I agree, I mean, near term, a market like Austin, a market like Nashville, it's going to have some more challenges given the glut of supply that's coming on. It's kind of like a, a pig through a Python right now, right? All the supply yeah. trying to be absorbed by some of these markets. But if you look at the long-term demographics in terms of population growth, companies investing there, so on and so forth, I believe that these markets are still going to be in a really good spot long-term. So how do you kind of juxtapose those two different factors where maybe some of the more current data might indicate some of the Midwest markets are doing a little bit better now than thinking about the long-term picture as well, that, you know, some of these growth markets will probably be in a really good spot long-term. Like, how do you kind of think about that? Yeah. And that's something I've thought a lot about and just kind of how things worked out. So I moved to the Sun Belt in 2023. I moved to Austin, Texas from Chicago. And then the rest of the company works in Chicago. And the plan at the time was we're going to get an office going in Austin and we're going to have uh, two offices and think of them as one is like the if this was a, a mutual fund, one is like the income office, like cap rates are higher in the Midwest, right? So there's more cash flow. And then down here in the Sun Belt, this is the growth office. We're we're the we're the tech stock, if you will, the the world down here. But then we when you look at the math, the data we have, we go, right now is the time to focus on the higher cap rate, more stable, still doing well markets. But yeah, you're right. Like the Sun Belt's not going anywhere. And when you look back in the data we have now, starting in the year 2000, one thing that is was the number one insight I had looking at that. It, it had nothing to do with the the future actually it was what happened in the past and was interesting to me too. Cause when I went to college for real estate it was 2004 to 2007. And so when I was in school, we learned it was the best markets that ever want to be in is New York, LA, San Francisco, Boston, these gateway markets, they have the highest returns, the least risk, the best liquidity, I mean, like, cause all the, the most buyer demand. So those are the best markets. That's what you're learning. They have the lowest cap rates because of that. And that was continued to be the song of what everyone said until, you know, about 2016 or 17, the conversation changed where actually the Sun Belt is where to be. And what's interesting is coming out of the GFC. So then starting about 2012, the Sun Belt outperformed those gateway markets the whole time. And by 2017, everybody noticed. So long answer to give you here, but the I don't think those trends are are changing long term. I think the Sun Belt got overbuilt and went hyperbolic with the growth. And so now it's coming down. If somebody looks at a chart of what happened, it's like, yeah, of course that was going to drop, you know, in hindsight now. And we bought deals in the Sun Belt too. So it's not like we were immune to this. So I think long term, I think the trend that was going on from 2012 till last year basically is going to continue. I think, you know, we just need the supply to get work through and have, you know, the population and job growth. It's our, it's still there, but actually what's interesting is in our model, it's the things that drove the model the most were population growth rate of change, rent growth, and median household income growth rate of change. So when you think of rate of change, like those things in the Sun Belt are dropping off. The, the free money from the government shut off, the higher interest rates, it obviously impacts what you can pay on your 
you know, your property's loan, but also your regular renter, they are borrowing money for their car or credit cards, things that could be, you know, their rates went up, so they're getting squeezed more. And so then, you know, their their income is either dropping or not going up as fast and they're feeling it on the expense side. So I think that stuff, once the growth comes back, yeah, I mean, our things that drove the model the most, th- that would be pointing to the Sun Belt again, I'm sure, in, in two or three years. So yeah, we're we're not we're trying to be in both like participate in both for different reasons. Sure. You know, one is, you know, kind of steady eddy stability. And the other one is, you know, you you could you should expect higher returns if you're, you know, in like a normal normal cycle, but a lot of that return from appreciation in the Sun Belt. Yeah. Love it, man. That's really, really interesting and very helpful perspective. And you'd mentioned your underwriting model a little bit earlier. I'd be curious to know your perspective as well, because when we go out there and underwrite deals, I know your team's doing the same thing as ours. We're just ripping through deals day in and day out, right? Rent roll, OM, T12, looking through the deals, trying to find that diamond in the rough. So in that process, we're capturing and collecting a lot of data. And curious to know, like from your process perspective, what do you do with that underwriting data? Do you have some way that you warehouse that data so you can kind of go back to it a later period in time? Like, what do you do to capture and make that data useful for you when you not only underwrite deals, but maybe even when you're operating the deals as well? Yeah, we have two databases, so to speak. One is for all the properties that we own currently or ever owned. It tracks our operating expenses every year and then breaks it down by line item per unit. So if if you wanted to know like what our average repair and maintenance per unit in Chicago has been since 2013, like I could open it up and tell you if we want to break it down by types of properties, we have it broken out by certain ages of properties or unit sizes, too. So that's been a incredibly helpful tool because we are underwriting with the real numbers that have happened the last you know, 12 years. Let's say if it's in Chicago or somewhere we already own and we're building the same it, the Phoenix is in the database too for the five deals we got in Phoenix. And so we're underwriting with real assumptions. So that's, you know, frustrates the the deal guys where, you know, we, other people underwrite lower taxes and lower repairs and maintenance and less, uh, you know, CapEx, uh, but we're under, underwriting with the real numbers you know, at least how we run it. And then separately, and I guess you do want to keep in mind how the market underwrites, because I would say if our numbers were lower, like we could run them better, we we probably would, we would at least value the property based on how the market does. So if let's say we had some magic way we could have half the repairs and maintenance as everyone else, we, pr- we would make like a separate pro forma for cash flow that has lower RM and then a separate one for sale. And then on deals we underwrote but didn't buy, we have a database as well that we developed. It's connected to our underwriting model and you press a button and then a macro runs and it pulls off 900 different data points from the model and puts it in a spreadsheet that we have that we call the database. And it has one line with all of those data points. And so what we do then is we underwrite things consistently because of that. Cause then let's say we're looking at a townhouse deal in Milwaukee or something. We'll, we'll look at all the deals that are similar that we ever underwrote and go, how do we underwrite these in the past? Mm. Just to make sure, let's say, cause I kind of have a theory that a lot of deals that get bought, it's, it's like some weird quirk happened in the underwriting. And that's why that was the one that worked. Like they got, like, maybe you got a T12 that was really low on some expenses. And then you, the way you work is you just underwrite kind of the same way the owner does. And then that was the one you bought. Whereas we would put that in our database and go, well, yeah, the reason this deal looks good is normally we underwrite a thousand a unit for that kind of building. And then for that line item, and we have only 600 in there. That's why maybe we should bump that up. And so that's been a really good tool. We track the price that it you know sells for as well in there and where we got to. And yeah, we're just consistently right now coming up, you know, 10 to 20 percent below the the price that the seller wants. So there, yeah, it's just been a lot of, you know, banging our heads against the wall the last this is going on two years now where we've bought two deals in the last two years. So, yeah, we don't have anything that's in the under contract at the moment either. So it's going to be, you know more than two years. So yeah. kind of with two deals. You made some really good points there too, especially when it comes to the expenses as well and deals actually getting under contract. Yeah. I mean, maybe somebody didn't notice the the deal, the current operator was putting repairs and maintenance expenses below the line or something like that. And it was running really yeah. well in that, in that uh, T12 file. So the fact that you've got that database, you can kind of benchmark your current underwriting with how you've kind of thought about it historically, I think it's a really powerful tool that you have there. And I want to talk to you a little bit about 
what you're seeing that's working in the market right now. So where are you finding opportunities right now? I know you mentioned you only did two deals in the last two years. We're, we're pretty much in a similar spot as well, where, you know, we're about 15% below guidance on pretty much everything that we're underwriting. But if we actually get within 10%, we're, we're getting excited and putting offers in. But uh, in terms of the, the deals that you have gotten across the finish line, What's working right now for you? You know, where are you finding the opportunities and what do they look like kind of quantitatively, like cap rate, leverage point, debt terms, et cetera. I'd love to just hear you elaborate a little bit. Yeah. So the first deal we closed on last uh, November, 2023, it was a, a, a 50 unit property in Chicago in the West Loop neighborhood it was built in 2016. We bought it for $18 million and I'm just, I'm rounding all the numbers off, but we're, we bought it for 18 million. We were sent the deal by a broker, but it was not it was not widely marketed. And then it was from a seller we had bought from before. And then in the West Loop neighborhood, we own a the same building basically, but it's 72 units already. We already owned a great comp. So we had a really good idea on what the rents should be or could be, as we we thought they could be lifted. And then it was also available with a loan assumption. We had tried buying it the same time we bought the other one from them. And we, we were only, I think, penciling to 18 and a half million at the time. And that was, you know, it was too low. This is back in like 2020. Mm. And so we just hung around the hoop as, as the saying goes. And, oh yeah, we were eventually able to get it for 18. And then their loan had five more years of term to go. And the interest rate was 4.6%. The loan was already amortizing. So then no interest only, you know, that's one thing where with people underwrite assumptions, I guess one tip, I'm sure most people realize it, but you got to figure out where they are in their amortization schedule and model it out appropriately. Cause we, depending on how far in you are, you might, you're paying a lot more principal potentially than you did if you started a new loan. And then that's, you want to have that factored in because you might be surprised how much the principal and interest payment is compared to starting a new one. That one, they were just starting the principal and interest. So it was just like, if you did, it's a 10 year fixed Fannie loan. And we literally bought it in like month, like 61 of the loan. So it was just, just when principal and interest was starting, the going in cap rate was about a six, was six and a quarter. And that's, that's tax adjusted. So then, you know, assuming the taxes go up post purchase, but they haven't gone up yet. So then it's, it's delivering a higher uh, yield on cost than that right now because the taxes haven't adjusted and then the rents are below market. So then we thought we could lift that to like a six, seven, five cap once we move the rents to market and the taxes adjust. So then, you know, that that's a lot of positive leverage. And so that's makes sense by conventional metrics, having positive leverage. And truthfully, I don't remember what the IRR or multiple or whatever we had projected at the time were because I, I remember more of the deal data points and that one filled up that was a you know a pretty easy raise for us where that was we raised five and a half million dollars and then because people they hadn't saw a lot of like newer nicer stuff long-term hold i think a lot of people they kind of got tired of the buy an old property renovate it and then sell it immediately plan and uh i mean there's a time and a place for that i'm sure we will do those again as well so it was really well received and that one filled up you know quite easily. And, but the next one, the returns were even higher when we closed on a month later, but that one, because it was second, we kind of, you know, some people kind of put in the money they wanted, or I guess they had like whatever their allocation in their head was, they already had put it in. And this, cause it, it was a very similar deal. The next deal was 53 units for 18 and a half million in the same neighborhood by the same builder. Just the only difference is the first one was built in 2016. This was built in 2020. But this one, we were stabilizing to even a higher cap rate. This one, it was more, it was still kind of fresh off like that initial lease up type rents where they never really moved those fully to market. And so that one had even more loss to lease. So the term for the rents being under market, more loss to lease to capture. So that one I, are using similar metrics. We thought we could stabilize that to a, a seven cap tax adjusted, which, you know, people say they want a seven cap, uh, like, you know, some of these like investors or whoever, and then it's like, it's nearly impossible in this market. I mean, Chicago, it's possible for the right deal, but you know, that's in part because the people might not perceive that as having as much growth as other places long term and also has some tax risk, which you know we could talk to, but where once you're actually in the market, the taxes in, in Cook County, they they grow slower than in, in Texas where I am now, for example. So it's uh people, you know, can can get comfortable with it. And we've had, you know, haven't really had a, any bad outcomes with our property taxes, like a surprise where like you get smoked type of thing. 
But the second deal, yeah, stabilizing it to a seven cap. It's actually been paying out 8% cash on cash since the day we bought it, which exceeded what we originally were projecting because we thought we would stabilize it to a seven cap and then borrow at 6.35%. And what ended up happening is while we were kind of slow to raise the money, we ended up getting an extension for the time to close. And during that time, we picked up a larger investor. A family office came in for half the equity and just was like, they saw the deal. They were like, we'll just take all the rest that's that's left. Where we were exploring pref equity and then they also do common equity. They saw the deal and then we're like, well, the pref, that was like our backup plan. If we needed it kind of thing, we're not going to we hope we don't need it, to be honest, but, it, you know, it's like nice meeting. It was kind of like the conversation. And then they're like, they're like, we also do common equity. And definitely if you can close it this year, we're in. And now it's like, for how much? And they're like, as much as, as much as we can. And so that, so then when they said that, I was like, all right, well, let's switch to the five-year interest only loan, put a little more money down. Because at that point we only had, I think a $2 million slug of equity left. We had four of the 6 million raised, but we had 4 million raised pretty quick for this deal. And then for a month, we didn't raise any money. So we're looking at going like, wow, how are we going to close this out? We kept, kept working it and fighting. And then sure enough, once we're like, Hey, we're about to close it out. Then like another 800 grand of money comes through, you know, where everyone's like, Oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in now for in the last second. So I should have maybe just told everyone where, or once I had the 4 million raise, we're wrapping it up. And then the other 2 million would have appeared. But so anyway, so then we ended up putting down seven and a half million instead of six, and then doing the 35% down option and going full term interest only while that was happening, rates drop. So then we ended up getting really fortunate with rates and we have a uh, five year interest only five year term loan at 5.53% interest. So we just caught it as rates fell at the end of the year. And, um, so that's why it's 8% cash on cash. So it's, you know, you're at a seven cap and that bar at five and a half interest only. So I don't, I wouldn't think all of our, you know, that's not typical that amount of cash flow for a multifamily deal, but we, yeah, I got, got fortunate on that for sure. Love that story. That's awesome. And a couple of just quick follow-up questions on that as well. So these assets, they sound like more core plus sort of strategies, core plus sort of asset, newer vintage, pretty nice. When you think about, it seems to me, at least the core plus assets that we've reviewed fairly recently, it can be a little bit harder to kind of hit that hurdle rate that investors are going to expect and require. Sometimes there's just not quite as much meat on the bone. But when you kind of compare the value add strategies you might do on a core plus sort of asset like that compared to the value add strategies you might do on more of a traditional 80s vintage value add multifamily sort of property, like how might the business plan and the value add strategies differ? Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's a good a, a good thing for investors to think about. You know, for us on these deals, they were penciling to value add returns just because of the nature of getting at such a high cap rate. But normally that's not the case. Yeah. If you look at something newer, nicer, let's say in Phoenix, they're still going for solidly negative leverage day one, you know, where that might sell at a five and a half cap and you're borrowing at, you know, unless it was that exact moment we locked rate, you're borrowing, you know, closer to six or six and a quarter today. And that's going to drive returns down a lot. So, I mean, I would rather, if this is what you're asking, like, I would rather take like a safe 12 or 13% return than take like a gamble on a value add strategy right now and maybe be penciling to a 15 or 16, if that's what you're, is that what you're asking? Kind of how do I think about that? Or more so, more so like maybe even just like looking at the properties you have in Chicago, what are the actual strategies that you're going to be employing on those properties versus like what you might do on an 80s vintage property value add? You know, is there like tech packages? Like, is there like different strategies you might pursue on that core plus compared to like some of the older stuff? Yeah. So what on these buildings, really our strategy, there's two things. It was really, we knew the rents were below market. So we have, we're, we're getting, we're raising the rents and not a small amount, like hundreds of dollars a unit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, these are on two beds that rent for, you know, $3,200. So then if you can lift the rent, you know, from 3000 to 3250 or something, that's the lift. So we, we know that's there. So that, and then also then we implement an amenity package. So then we then have a Comcast as a provider in, in Chicago that we use. And so we get the internet from them at $25 a month per unit. And then that plus then advertising how we have a package system, like a Luxor one and anything else we can like throw in the package. Like we have rooftop with a grill. And so we call it an amenity package. So that's going to get you the rooftop the, with the grill, the Luxor, the, 
your inner your internet uh one of the buildings has a gym and then also like some of them have the electronic locks like latch or butterfly max intercom so we say you have that and then depends on the building how much we charge and what the unit is but we're charging anywhere from 70 to 110 dollars a unit on those and our cost is 25. that's awesome and, yeah per month so then we implement that so yeah it's not as high of a lift as like hey we're gut renovating this thing but the risk is a lot smaller so i think yeah we're really focused on what yield on cost, we can stabilize the building too. That's been always my number one metric. There was actually a while when I just had one investor, I he didn't even ask what the IRR is. He just wanted to know what our yield on cost was. And that's, that's your, when you're done with your business plan, let's say on mine, it was once we move the rents to market, we implement the amenity package and then our taxes adjust to the full amount. What cap rate are you in based on your price and that NOI then? That's yield on cost is the um, term. Sometimes people call it untrended yield on cost too, because I'm factoring all that in in today's prices. So what is the rent today that I would get? And then um, what cap rate would I stabilize to if I could just snap my fingers and make the whole building at that level? And so they say untrended because that means with no growth added. Trended would be if there was growth added. Gotcha. Yeah, that's excellent. That's a savvy investor too, to focus on that metric for sure. And one quick follow-up question on the amenity package. So you'd mentioned the internet aspect of it. So is that a simple like revenue sharing agreement with Comcast or is it more like you're actually hosting the internet, your residents get internet through you, through the amenity package, and you're kind of capturing a spread through kind of that process? Yeah, we once a unit signs up, they start billing us the 25 Gotcha. And so we we capture we're capturing that spread at a different at some of our smaller buildings we have it where it's just it's internet only in the package and that I think we committed where we just are buying internet for every unit at twenty five or those might be a little more twenty eight a month and then where everyone has internet so we're basically you know saying like you you need to take the like you need to take the package it's not optional because I have saw other people do it it's it's at least Comcast so what's in that market it's this is a great system, but other places I've looked at deals I've saw where landlords have, they've actually brought their own fiber optics somehow to the property. They bought all the modems and then they have some sort of deal where they are, they're using some company to like support this connection or network or something, but then they, they're capturing a bigger spread. Like their cost is six bucks or 10 or something. I don't, I haven't done one of those, so I don't know the numbers. And then I have saw the revenue sharing ones too. Those aren't as lucrative. A lot of the buildings we buy have those, and then we're replacing that with this plan. Makes sense. Drew, this has been a great conversation, man. Really appreciate you stopping by and sharing all of your insights with me and our audience again. And if people want to follow you and what you've got going on at Brenneman Capital, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, go to Brenneman.com. So just like my last name, we got everything about the company there. You can schedule a call with us or sign up to be an investor there or just just email me, Drew at Brenneman.com and uh, reach out. Sounds good. Drew, again, thank you so much for your time today, man. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.